Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the latest episode of This Is Why We Stand, a special Veterans Day edition. I'm your host, Joe Archino, and I'm very proud to have Dave Rocco back with me once again. Dave, you know, it's been a while since we've been doing this in person, and we've got to adapt as most of the world does right now. But it is very good to see you, my friend, for this special episode. Uh, Joe, it's great to be back again. I appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. Now, I think obviously, first and foremost, you always have to start with the crazy world we're living in right now. You know, how have you're one of the busiest guys I know? You're always up to doing something. And there is some great news we do have to share. Obviously, anyone who's heard before, or maybe you're a new listener, Dave is one of the authors of The Indestructible Man, the true story of World War II hero Captain Dixie Kiefer. And we're going to get into his story a little bit here. But uh, what, what have these past few months been like for you, adapting and overcoming all these challenges? Um, in regard to uh, the ceremony itself to honor the 1945 guys, that was just this past weekend, but the actual date is tomorrow, November 11th. But we also honored um, the uh, the Mount Beacon eight six men on November 11, 45, and two men on September 14, 1935. So that ceremony we had uh, up at the Quare site um, on September 14, um, back on the 2020. Um, so tomorrow we plan to go up again, the hike up to the Quare site of 45. The ceremony I just mentioned was the town of Fishkill's Veterans Park, and it was a beautiful ceremony. Uh, not just uh, about the Mount Beacon Day, but two local, uh, three local uh, Fishco residents that were killed in Vietnam. Uh, the county and the town uh, rededicated three streets in their names in their honor. That is always great to hear, and I'm very glad to hear that the ceremony went well. And just to give anyone a little bit of context, what, what Dave is referring to, the Mount Beacon 8, there were two plane crashes around Mount Beacon, New York, one in 1935 and a second one on November 11, 1945, which is going to be the 75th anniversary of that crash tomorrow. And of course, among those who fell that day was the legendary Dixie Kiefer, who earned the nickname The Indestructible Man. Dave, uh, for your book, obviously, the, na the title, it's, it's aptly named The Indestructible Man. Uh, tell us, you know, what, what was the inspiration behind writing this book? You know, was it the second you, you heard the story of Dixie Kiefer, it was one of those things where you knew you had to write it? Was it a connection between, you know, you, it, it, this happening right in your backyard? What was it for you? Well, for me, it was, I had just finished working on the walkway over the Hudson Project and the professionals took over the project, so the volunteers job was over because we put it in the hands of the people if the project was ever going to get done, that's the way it was. And obviously, 11 years ago, the bridge got opened for, as a walkway. So right around that time, I got involved in the restoration of the Mount Beacon Fire Tower. So we had a ceremony June 2013 uh, to uh, commemorate the restoration work. Somebody walked up to me after the ceremony and said, by the way, are you familiar with a plane crash Mount Beacon? And I said, what do you know about it? He said, I don't know too much. Thank God for the internet. I started to do some research and I just couldn't believe it. There was this Navy legend killed a Mount Beacon, Dixie Kiefer. I just like read through his background. I mean, my original goal was, and I got involved with other people along the way too. Um, I wanted to bring recognition to the other men that were killed. And this is before I found out about the 1935 crash because originally we called the group the Mount Beacon Six. So then we found out with the help of the uh, historian from the uh, city of Beacon, uh, the late Bob Murphy, he told me about the 1935 crash. So now we recreate the new name, Mount Beacon Eight, uh, to um, you know, include the guys from 35. Um, it's just like, it was a story that needed to be told. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, it's definitely local history. If you love military history, if you love, I mean, Dixie Keeper was a legend, larger than life, of course. You read all the newspaper articles back then. He got headlines. I mean, he was hanging out with some big people, Branch Rickey, uh, Vincent Peale. Um, it goes endless. Now, maybe one asked the question, where did that name come from? The indestructible man. Um, without going through the whole history, we'll just go back seven months prior to the plane crash. Dixie Keeper was getting an award in Rockefeller Center uh, for his exploits on the uh, USS Ticonderoga aircraft carrier. He was the first commanding officer 
back in January of 45, within the span of one hour, two kamikaze planes hit the flight deck. The first one, he wasn't injured too much on it, but the second one, they tried to go for the communications tower or the con tower, or the R one, depends on your uh, background. He was up on the bridge, and the Navy really wasn't too keen on their commanding officers hanging outside. They wanted them in the pilot house, but Dixie always wanted to be out on the bridge running the show. Uh, at that point, the impact uh, broke his arm, and he had 65 pieces of shrapnel in his body, but he refused to leave his post. And so the kamikaze attack stopped, the fires were put out, and all the men were taken care of by the medical staff. Um, that was 11 hours later. So getting back to the ceremony, Secretary of the Navy and the first Secretary of War, James Forrest, was reading off Dixie Keeper's exploits between World War I, which was in Europe, and then, of course, World War II. He turns around and says, you're the indestructible man. And who would know seven months later, Dixie Keeper would get killed in Forrestal's hometown. I think that's one of the most tragic things of all. You know, the, the, you think of this incredible hero and he survives the First World War, the Second World War. And like you just mentioned there, you know, the way he went out in, in a plane crash like that, it's just tragic. But you do, it's such a wonderful book. And, you know, like you said, I think anyone who's a military history buff who, who just likes to, to just read or about a remarkable, extraordinary figure in American history. It's something that you really will enjoy picking up. And certainly there's some great news that we do have to share for your book. Your book actually got recently got picked up by a major publisher. It's got a redesigned cover and, and it just looks, I love the new redesigned cover. Um, and hopefully this store will get out to even more people. But one of the things- Yeah, I was see, very excited. Uh, my call, uh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. I was going to say my co-author, Don Keith, I mean, he's a professional writer. He's written over 30 books. He was so disappointed in other the publishers he worked with in the past would pick up the book. So he has his own publishing company and we self-published it. So within the last six months or so, I kind of contacted somebody from a friend that I knew and they said, oh yeah, let's do it. And then of course, COVID came in, so backed everything up because they wanted to release it around now because it'd be uh, apropos between the 85th anniversary and the 75th anniversary, uh, you know, timeframes. So now they're gonna uh, release it April 1st, 2021, which is about a month before um, Memorial Day weekend, which is really when you honor the dead. I mean, Veterans Day ceremony the other day happened to be because the plane crash did happen on November 11th, which was Armistice Day back then. So it, that's pretty cool that now I could get to maybe a bigger audience because I tried the best I could to promote it. I got a lot of help along the way. People like you, the New York Times, did a story on it. Uh, we were booking a week in the uh, New York Post. So, but to be picked up three years later, so we obviously must have a good story there. I, I mean, you absolutely do. And like you said, I think the greatest thing about this news is that it will hopefully get to more people. And it, it is a tale that needs to be told. And it, it really does tie into one of the things you talked about, your motivations for telling this story is, you know, we do put so much of a spotlight on Cat, uh, on Commodore Dixie Kiefer, and rightfully so, but there were other men who have incredible tales from your book as well. Why don't you talk about a few of the other individuals who really ha ha have meaningful stories and impacted you? All right, so we'll go back to the 1935 crash. Lincoln Denton was from uh, the Northern uh, Peninsula of Michigan. Um, he was a Harvard graduate and he was a commercial artist. So again, like I said, he would serve his time. He did his first four years and then he would serve in the reserves for a few years after that. Um, and, and then his aviation machinist mate, uh, Clinton Hart, who was actually born here in Westchester County in Katona, then he moved to the city. Uh, he, was, he was one of the two that got married and he and his wife moved to Manhattan. He worked for the New York Stock Exchange. Um, it really, it was the records I got for both of them, especially um, Lincoln Denton, there's a gap missing from 1931 to 35 because he asked for uh, a leave for one year so he could get his postgraduate degree. So I had tried out uh, reaching out to the personnel records department to um, you know, try and get that missing gap, but somebody sent me a photograph of him receiving an award in October 1933. Turns out when he was stationed down in Philadelphia Navy Yard, they sent them out in a plane out in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of New Jersey to try and find survivors from the Ak Akron balloon disaster. 
um, 78 member on that and um, only three survives. And clearly the admiral who died, who just received a short period of time ago was a Congressional Medal of Honor. But one of those victims, believe it or not, was from Peekskill. Uh, so these are things I was able to piece together that I was able to find a photograph of him holding this trophy that he got for that um, exploit, a heroic effort next to a plane. And next, next to him was the insignia that he drew himself, which was the logo for the crew that he was on. Uh, so now we go 10 years later and there's six guys there. You know, we could talk about Dixie Keeper in a minute because he had a 30 year career starting with the Naval Academy starting in 1915. But the um, interesting fact was there was a doctor on board, Lieutenant Commander Dr. Ignatius Solinsky from Salem, Mass. Um, he was 42 years old when he joined uh, World War II in the Navy. He also served in World War I in the Army. I mean, I don't think he had to go, but I guess he felt obligated to go because he could offer something. But they put him uh, in what they call the Special Battalion um, Construction uh, Division. First he went to Virginia and then Oakland and then a whole bunch of islands out in the South Pacific. And I couldn't get any definitive information on it because I guess the, the records again are incomplete. Uh, next was the co-pilot, Hans Kohler, who was born in Germany, actually came to America when he was three years old. He's from Garfield, New Jersey. A month after he graduated high school in 1938, he signed up for the Navy, he worked his way up to be chief gunner mate. And he actually, um, in the early part of uh, World War I, he actually damaged a German submarine in, in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, they liked him so much, they put him down in Pensacola and become a pilot. He got his wings, headed out west, and he also uh, was in 20 combat missions. He was just 25 years old. He sank three ships and whatever damage he caused on the, uh, the fights, the missions on the installations on the islands. Um, then you have uh, the younger two guys on board. You had um, David Wood from Connecticut. He was just 23. Uh, David um, was basically a radio man, but uh, he also, uh, they called Link, Operator instructor, I guess it's like uh, uh, some sort of uh, what's the word for when they do the uh, the test for pilots. Um, it'll come back to me. But the other one that's more important it, to me is the most that I got out of this was Clarence Hooper. Clarence Hooper was an African American from Greensboro, North Carolina. He was the aviation machinist mate, third class. Um, like David Wood, Clarence never left continental United States. Uh, the, um, the six of them at the time they were killed were stationed in Quonset Point, Rhode Island, Naval Air Station. All they did was they came down on the Saturday afternoon, November 10th, spent one overnight. They went to a football game at Yankee Stadium to see Army versus Notre Dame. Um, the top four teams back then were Army, Navy, Notre Dame, and Alabama. And my partner, who wrote the book with me, is from Alabama. He went to the University of Alabama and he wrote the life story of Ben Bryant. So I mean, you can't make this stuff up. No. So it's another way he's connected. So just to get back to Clarence Hooper for a second, um, think about it. It's an African American that was on the plane with five other uh, Caucasians um, going to the big city, Manhattan, because they landed in an airport in New Jersey. It was called Curtis Wright Airport. Now it's called Essex County Airport in Coldwell, New Jersey. Uh, who knows where they went that night, but they met the next morning. At the airport, during the 11th hour, on the 11th day, in the 11th month, and they crashed their plane in Mount Beacon, 1,100 feet up. So it, it's just one thing after another. And, and like I said to you before about going back and looking over the notes, it was really eerie for me and sad to me because of the... Um, discrimination. For six straight months, Clarence probably knew airplanes inside and out, applied to be an aviator. Six months later, 15 days later, he was denied. And on top of it, the list of the application, it said Negro. So take up what you want, but I think obviously that had a lot to do why he got turned down. Uh, uh, Clarence was the only one out of the eight that had children. He had a boy, 
um, out of wedlock uh, a year or two before that, and 13 months before the accident, he had a daughter by the name of Patricia. Now, when I did my first hike in 2015 to bring this awareness to everybody, we got some publicity, uh, the press was there, uh, some of the cable companies. Somehow she got a hold of the hike that we did, and she wrote to me and said, I think Clarence Hoop is my father. And we've been in touch since that time. Now, she was supposed to come up for the ceremony last week, but because of the new guidelines that the governor uh, implemented, um, she couldn't take a chance on getting stuck in New York just for an overnight. And uh, it was beautiful. The town gave, and the county gave her a beautiful proclamation. So I think, um, and she thanked me on several occasions, beautiful little notes about, I never knew my father to this day. She doesn't have a photograph of her father. So she was very, very, very grateful because I made copies of the personnel records, sent them to her. So now she knows a lot more about her father than ever before. And last but not least, I have been to seven out of the eight grave sites because four out of the eight are in Arlington. So the two from 35 are in Arlington, Dixie Keeper and Lloyd Heinsohn, the pilot from 45 are both in, in uh, Arlington. I've been down there several times. So I've been up to sale in Massachusetts to see Dr. Uh, Sawinski. Uh, Hans Cole, Alan Garfield, New Jersey, and in Norwich, Connecticut, David Wood. So I wasn't going out to Greensboro anytime soon. So I called up the cemetery and I said, possible you could take a photograph of the headstone for me. And they said, um, sure, give us a couple of days. So a few days later, the phone call came back. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but he's buried in an unmarked grave. Wow. So I, so I started to talk to a few people and somebody had said to me, you know, the VA gives um, free headstones you got to start the process. It could be lengthy, but get it going. So I, I called the daughter up and I said, look, uh, I'll send you an application. She says, no, no, you take care of this because you know how to do things like that. I had no idea how to do this. So work in partnership with the cemetery in Greensboro, North Carolina, we got the okay. And they installed the headstone by Memorial Day of this year. And we're supposed to have a ceremony, but obviously with the COVID stuff going on, they had to postpone this to next year. So you know, the book and all these different things and bringing attention to people for local history because my theme about this whole thing is uh, forgotten by some because there's not that many people around anymore from 75, 85 years ago and unknown to most. Fine, but to bring um, some sort of recognition to Clarence Hooper with a headstone, it was just a piece of grass for 75 years. If that's, I'll be happy just for that. That is just inspiring, Dave, and I really commend you and am so inspired by everything you've done to honor the Mount Beacon Nate. Things like that, you know, I think every one of us can do something in our own way to help keep the memory alive of those who've served our country. And I think that right there, you know, your theme and your message is a perfect example of that, how you took a local story and then you widened it out and did this wide search and brought it all back together. It, it really is incredible. And uh, I'm sh I, I know you've, you've touched the lives of other people in doing so. You should be very proud. Before we end, I want to hit one other thing, Dave. And, you know, this is a huge year for 75th anniversaries. This year marked the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Your father is a World War II veteran. And, of course, with it being Veterans Day, I just wanted to get your thoughts and you know what your father's service, what, what do you think back, what are your thoughts when you think back on that and his sacrifices for our nation? Well, it's funny you ask that question because um, of all the things I've done, I kind of developed relationships with people in the media. And when I told them about the story uh, about the fire tower, so not the fire tower, so well, they did cover that a couple of years ago, but with the Mount Beacon story coming up, and I said, yeah, you know, my father's a veteran too. Oh yeah. Um, tell us more about it. You have any photographs? I sure. I sent it to him. I said, all right, um, we're going to do a story on your father. I said, really? So mm -hmm. he called me up last week and uh, I gave it to um, a contributing writer because obviously they don't have enough people. Uh, they have very few people on the staff. 
So Father and I went over, we spoke for a couple hours about all these different things. He would ask me about the photographs. He wanted to talk to my father, but he obviously, I said, look, you'd be really wasting time. He's a very bad hearing problem. So pretty much I could tell you everything because um, on the assistance of my son-in-law, who's in the Air Force, he said, look, why don't you record your father in conversations and get him to talk about his experiences? So I finally got around to it back in uh, February, March, and May. So about 30 minutes each session uh, with my cell phone. So I kind of got a flavor of everything what went on and what his feelings, because he really did talk about it for obviously many years. And as kids, we didn't give a damn one way or the other, because, you know, it's just, we weren't interested as we get older, we appreciate things like that more. Most, some of us do for that matter. So um, I was able to answer a lot of questions to the reporter. And so he calls me back the next day and said, uh, this is my uh, second draft. I want you to listen to me. And if there's anything you feel needs to be corrected, I was such to read this. And I mean, it started, just started to come out down my face and I said, just talk about my father here. And um, he says anything. I said, you got one date one, but no big deal. But this is incredible. I mean, she says, I think they're aiming to put your father on the cover because what it is, it's um, the Beacon Free Press, the Northern and Southern Dutchess News. They have a pullout section every Veterans Day. Uh, so it's coming out tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to it. And I can bring a copy over to my father, see his reaction. Because, you know, like a lot of those guys, I never... Um, uh, what for the limelight? They just went uh, about their business, did their thing, came back home, and got on with their lives. Um, I shared some of these stories on Facebook pages of like uh, the Navy Facebook pages, the uh, Esther Carrier aircraft carrier uh, pages, the Ticonderoga pages, whatever, the Yorktown pages, because you know, we, we can get back to Dixie Keefer and give your um, viewership a better um, handle of what Dixie did in his career. But I got one story back from a guy about uh, saying that Dixie Keeper took him on one of the flights when Dixie was a pilot with himself. And back then, they didn't have aircraft carriers. They catapulted off of a battleship. So it said because of his experience with Dixie, he applied to become a fighter pilot, and he went to Pensacola as well. So he said, I don't mean to hijack your post you know, on Facebook about the story. And I wrote back, I said, you kidding me? This is what the purpose of this is, to share stories like that, that very people know about. And if that could trigger somebody else to talk about whatever, this is why it's here. Uh, Just amazing, Dave, it really is. And I, I think it really shows why it's so important to get all of this stuff out there, because you never know who might find it and, and the more connections you make through all of that. But Really, that really is special, and that I can't wait, and I hope that your father really, really enjoys seeing that because he certainly deserves the recognition. And I think it's so special that you were able to sit down and get those opportunities with him to record his story. Because if there's anything that I think we need to continue to do today, it's to make sure we document everything we have of our World War II veterans. It's so important, especially with this being the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. Uh, everybody's story has a place and has significance. And I think right there, your father's is certainly one. It's just one of those many, many examples of things we should never forget. I, and you just retrain a memory. Um, about two years ago, I had a photo exhibition down at the Tarrytown Library about my photographs of the Tapestry Bridge Project. And um, a year earlier, they opened up one side of the bridge and the governor of the state drove this old man in the yellow, 1955 yellow Corvette as the honorary first car over the bridge uh, because he drove a 1955 yellow Corvette over the original Tapestry Bridge in December of 55. So about a month and a half after that, he kind of walked by me in the street festival, Sleepy Hollow. So I walked up to him and said, I got a picture of you and the governor in that yellow, uh, yellow Corvette. He said, oh yeah, I want to see the photograph. I said, well, come over to the Tarrytown Library um, on Sunday, I have an exhibition because I'll meet you there. So it's okay. So I grabbed my father. See, maybe we get lucky. This guy's going to be there. Because this guy, Chickaloa, Armando Chickaloa, was at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. Now, we become friends because of this. And it's just, he's 99 years old. He'll be 100 on New Year's Day. And um, I brought my father down to meet him. And the two of them 
were all holding arm in arm. And it turns out when my father was on the ship on picket duty on the LCS on Okinawa, Chick was on the island fighting with the Marines. So he said, oh, you guys, you know, you were nice and dry and warm socks and three meals a day, and I'm in a hole eating bugs and getting dirt. So he, he helped my father. I just spoke to him the other day as uh, I try to stay on top of him. Um, you know, it's been an honor to meet somebody like that. And, uh, and I'm glad I got him and my father together. I love to hear that. And I've actually been, I've had the honor of interviewing Mr. Galil and what an incredible man. I mean, he's one of those people you just hang on to every single word that he says. And I, I consider, you know, one of the, you know, you rank all the interviews you do over the years and which ones, you know, are the most memorable. I always tell people, you know, he's right up there at the top with anybody I've ever done. He just, when he goes back in time and you just see in his eyes, reliving that that day at Pearl Harbor and then you know just his his perseverance and his bravery and all of that you know he's just one of the best of us and I'm sure him and your father you know that, that that's a sight I would have I wish I could have seen but just amazing Dave and you know we're, uh, we're running out of time here today so really appreciate your time and I know all the great work you continue to do I can't wait. I, I would love to get you on again as we get closer to the re-release of your book. Uh, there's always so much more to get into, but uh, thank you so much for your time today. I'm so grateful that for this and just all the work you do is so amazing and so important. So really keep it up and thank you so much for all that you do. All right, all right Joe, I appreciate it. If uh, your viewers want any more information, they can go online, just type in Dixie Keeper, uh, the Mount Beacon 8. And the internet will have all the search bars open up. Uh, the New York Times article, Lost in the Woods, uh, July 19, uh, 2017, I mean. Uh, so, and they get more from that. Uh, so, again, opportunities like this are very, very helpful as well. So, again, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, and make sure you go and you pick up the book, The Indestructible Man. It is one of my favorite reads, Dave. Where can people pick up the book? Well, right now they can still pick that up at Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, um, or they went online. Uh, the publisher is my partner, uh, Don Keith. It's called Erin Press, E-R-I-N Press. Uh, and then uh, when the book comes out in April, uh, that's uh, going to be uh, Roman and Littlefield's imprint called Stackpole Books. Again, they're really going to have the vehicle uh, to promote it. It's already been advertised in Europe. And I've seen it on the site. It's like uh, they redesigned the cover and they did very little edits to the book. So apparently they like what they saw. That's great. And we will definitely have you back on as we get closer to that so we can talk, get delve into the story even more. Um, but once again, Dave, thank you so much. Uh, for Veterans Day, we'll be thinking of your dad tomorrow and honoring him and along with all those who've served our great country. Really appreciate your time today. And like I always say, you keep on doing all the great work because you do so much important stuff. And if there's any, ever, any, anything we can do on our end to help you out, we're more than happy to do so. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Everybody, I'm Joe Archino. Thank you for listening. <laughs>